Assalamu alaikum, welcome to Game Changer, I'm Mariam Sia. In today's program, we will be exploring about one of the most pressing issues of our times, that is Israeli aggression on uh, Gaza. Uh, since October 7th, uh, we know that more than uh, 33,000 innocent Palestinians have been killed in this uh, Israeli aggression and uh, around and more than 70% of these are women and children. And uh, when we uh, look at uh, the humanitarian crisis that is unfolding uh, there in uh, Gaza, uh, there are staggering figures uh, uh, of uh, population that are facing acute hunger in uh, Gaza that is uh, around 1.1 1 million or around more than half of the uh, Gazan population is uh, facing this food insecurity and uh, when we look at the crisis of infrastructure of course um, only nine hospitals out of 36 uh, hospitals in uh, Gaza and uh, surrounding territories are functional and they are not fully functional and against this uh, backdrop when we look at the situation that is unfolding in uh, uh, other cities of the world as well as in Israel um, in uh, regions like uh, Jerusalem and Tel Aviv uh, of course tens of thousands of um, uh, civilians and citizens are on the streets against uh, these actions of the Israeli government. In today's program, we will be exploring uh, all these layers of the conflict and its implications on the region and beyond. Uh, to discuss this and more, we are joined in the studios by former Ambassador Naila Chohan. Welcome to the program. We are also joined by Mr. Shehjar Khan, who is Commentator Global Affairs. Welcome to the program. And we are joined online by uh, Dr. Sabir Abu Maryam, who is Secretary General Palestine Foundation Pakistan. Welcome to the program. Um, Ambassador Saber, let me start with you. Uh, of course, uh, we have been witnessing uh, this conflict unfolding before our eyes and uh, since October the 7th, um, the genocide uh, that is happening uh, there in uh, Gaza. Uh, how would uh, you define uh, this situation at this point in time uh, about the humanitarian crisis uh, that is unfolding before our eyes? The humanitarian crisis is unprecedented and uh, the tragic part is that the Israelis especially the IDF representatives are saying that uh, they are facilitating humanitarian aid so when asked that if you are facilitating humanitarian aid how come the population of Palestine is under threat of famine mm. and every day Children are dying, uh, women are dying, who have nothing to do with any violence that they claim for which they had uh, come forward for self-defense. And the worst is they're attacking hospitals. They're attacking areas where these people could be given refuge and shelter. So it is inexplicable how, uh, you know, grave the situation is. Right, and uh, Shehjar, you are expanding on uh, this situation. Uh, could you elaborate on the kill zones that have been, um, that are some areas that have been defined uh, by the Israeli military, uh, and also uh, these attacks that are being done on aid workers as well. Just uh, this morning, uh, we saw attacks on uh, the aid workers belonging from different countries like UK, Poland. Um, and of course they were just delivering food so the, this is unprecedented so how do you uh, and what do you make of uh, this situation so Mariam, these are what you basically defined as the blatant violations of international humanitarian law that are ta being taking place in um, uh, palestine unfortunately a few days ago israel also like took over the al shifa hospital which is one of the largest mm -hmm. hospitals over there and uh, they surrounded it they have like completely destroyed it Mm -hmm. And now uh, WHO, the UN uh, Agency for Health, they have given a statement that all of the patients in that hospital need to be shifted out. That hospital is now not in a condition to serve any patients mm -hmm. or provide any medical support or health care to any of the people who are residing there. Other than that, if we uh, look at the incident uh, today, uh, Israeli airstrike basically targeted workers of uh, INGOs, seven of different nationalities who were providing their services in uh, devastating conditions. Mm -hmm. 
and these are not uh, Arabs, these are not like citizens of, of uh, Palestine, these are like international aid workers mm -hmm. belonging to various different nationalities mm -hmm. who were rendering their services in that area and they have also been killed and uh, obviously there won't be any accountability of the Israeli mm -hmm. government so when it comes to that. What so. do you see the rationale behind these killings? Of course there is no rationale uh, behind killing of innocent Palestinians mm -hmm. as well. Uh, but do you think this is uh, to inculcate a fear factor in the aid workers that are uh, working in these, uh, these uh, devastating conditions in Gaza? So Israel has like made it clear that they will not provide and they will also not be giving any support when it comes to humanitarian aid coming into uh, mm -hmm. Palestine. And the biggest example for that is that the borders are still closed and the humanitarian aid uh, which is being provided by various Western countries, Middle East, mm -hmm. even Pakistan and even if you look at the US, they have like now established a zone inside the sea. So why cannot this aid basically come from the borders which is the quickest way of like providing people with these uh, support. So this is how blatantly Israel is trying to hold back international humanitarian aid from reaching the people. So it's a, a whole idea of collective punishment. And as you rightly uh, basically said that this attack on international aid workers as well is kind of a warning that they are not encouraging or they are like telling people to stay away from this area. Mm -hmm. They are also like giving a, uh, a declaration to the international community that international law does not apply to them and right. they will use every means possible that is there. Right, because because Sharia, we know that mm. all the agencies that mm. are working at this point in time in uh, Gaza, they are of course in constant contact uh, with mm. the Israeli authorities because they mm. cannot uh, function without that. Even then, uh, these attacks are being, uh, of course, taking place, targeting these innocent aid workers. But uh, coming to you, uh, Dr. Saber, uh, when we look at this uh, situation unfolding uh, and Israel's uh, unprecedented attacks and aggression continuing uh, since October 7th, how do you see the role of international community and of course after uh, ICJ's uh, decision uh, and of course the warnings, the precaution, precautions that uh, were uh, um, given uh, to the Israel and to give their report back. So do you think that Israel is trying to establish itself as a rogue state that no international law is applicable uh, to Israel? Uh, thank you. <coughs> First of all, uh, I would like to say that the story of Palestine and the, the, the incident of Palestine is not started from the 7th of October, of course. It is started since the Balfour Declaration in 1948 and before 1947 when the resolution uh, 181 was uh, passed through the United Nations and they have divided uh, the land of Palestine for the Zionists also. Uh, the story of 7th October is now is continue and we say that this is the systematic and organized genocide of the oppressed people of Palestine, those are suffering, those are oppressed since 78 years and now they are helpless and no one is come forward to help them because this is the systematic and organized genocide supported by the US and other Western governments. The second point in in your question about the international laws and uh, the, 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 the action of uh, South African government. Yes, the South African government action is, is very appropriate and we, we also appreciate this action in the ICJ. But unfortunately, the question is that, as Mr. Sharia uh, also stated that, who is the uh, authority to implement the international laws against these kind of brutal and illegitimate state. Even Zionist regime never accepted any resolution of United States, never considered uh, any law, any resolution, any kind of agreement. So who is the authority who will uh, impose or uh, authorize to, uh, to, 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 to implement these kind of decision? But, uh, we are with this, this kind of action, yes, morally, politically, and diplomatically. These kind of action, even in our ICJ or even in the uh, United Nations Security Council, this is a po political and uh, morally bounding uh, for all of us to respect these kind of action. But unfortunately, the, in case of Zionist regime, uh, any Zionist regime has a history to always deny these uh, 
uh, resolutions and all actions. So uh, I am very, you know, so they have no standard because they are not serious to stop this this kind of, this genocide in, in the Palestine. You know, we are talking about now the bombing, now the killing, now the missile, now that you have 35 supporting everything. But in last three weeks, 18 children, 18 children have been killed due to the hunger, due to the thirst. This is the situation. This is a very, very harm situation. Right. Of course, this is unprecedented humanitarian crisis that is unfolding before our eyes. But talking about the decision uh, by uh, International Court of Justice and countries like Pakistan uh, also, of course, uh, supported uh, this cause of uh, South Africa. But uh, how do you see, uh, Ambassador Saiba, the implications of uh, these, um, of course, voices uh, from the international community on Israeli actions? Uh, because at the same time, we are, of course, um, um, after so many failures, um, um, uh, this uh, resolution um, for ceasefire in uh, Gaza was passed at United Nations Security Council as well. But at the same time, we are uh, witnessing that uh, U.S. is also uh, providing uh, weaponry to Israel continuously. That is being used in the war. So how do you see these double standards? Well, uh, you're right. Uh, there are double standards. But uh, bear in mind that the resolution that was adopted uh, was adopted because the United States abstained. Mm -hmm. They did not vote in favor. Of course. They did not vote in against. Mm -hmm. So not voting against and may be considered positive. And this was the fourth positive. time that exactly. this resolution was presented. And of course, US did not veto it. Exactly. They did not veto it. So that's positive. But they abstained doesn't give that strength to the resolution mm -hmm. then when it comes to implementation, firstly. Secondly, as far as Israel is concerned, you have to look at their domestic politics. Right. Because right. Netanyahu is right, right. now. Uh, Ambassador Seba, I want to come to domestic politics. But before that, uh, like you mentioned that this uh, resolution has been unanimously passed after so many attempts by the international community. So, but what about the implementation uh, in question uh, at ground? Um, uh, in Gaza because we are seeing that the, the, the attacks and Israeli aggression are still continuing. Do you think this is also linked to the um, Israeli uh, internal politics? No, it's not uh, linked to the internal politics, but it's linked to their relations with these countries. Um, Canada has stated that they will not provide arms to Israel any longer. Uh, now, the problem is with the United States. Even if President Biden says that USA will not provide uh, arms aid to Israel, the fact of the matter is that the deal they already have mm. is uh, valid till 2028. Indeed. So for next four years, they will continue to get aid even if the US government, current government says that they are not going to provide any further aid. Right, right, but I have a small question in that, that are countries like US or other developed <coughs> countries for that matter are bound uh, <coughs> on that uh, ki kind of, uh, you know, uh, on paper negotiations or deals that they have done earlier uh, in, uh, in regard to these rogue states as well? You may call who it rogue not, states, they who don't. Are not, uh, who are not adhering to any of the international norms and humanitarian laws. You're right, but uh, they don't <coughs> define it as a rogue state. Mm. For them, Iran is a rogue state. Mm. And you s know what happened recently, that Israel has attacked yes. the we will be coming uh, to that uh, Iranian later uh, in the show, yes, of course. Uh, uh, so Imbassy, it is, it is very course. complex. Mm. Uh, and uh, the politics, the <coughs> domestic politics of these countries and domestic politics of Israel also have a lot of uh, bearing on the on the ground uh, developments. Hmm, of course. And uh, coming uh, to the ground developments, uh, Shehriyar, uh, what do you make of this, these protests uh, that we are witnessing not only on the streets of other parts of the world, but now in uh, big cities of Israel as well, like Tel Aviv, Jerusalem. And it is being said that these are one of the largest protests uh, that uh, Israel uh, or anti-government, uh, anti-Netanyahu protests have been so far. So 
what do you think are the reasons behind these protests? Of course, they are demanding uh, early elections. Uh, so do you think that uh, one of the reasons that uh, Netanyahu is not only listening, not listening to US at this point in time, uh, is because of this internal situation or political instability also, uh, as well as the social divide that is happening in Israel? So, uh, Mariam, there's a whole internal rift happening in the uh, Israeli society as well. And I also see a lot of like shift in Western capitals as well. If you look at the youth demographic, if you look at progressive uh, youth uh, alliances, other than that, uh, political parties as well, historically, which have been very pro-Israel, even they are like questioning their stance right now. When it comes to Netanyahu government, we all know that there are like very severe corruption charges on that government. Mm -hmm. And the way Netanyahu is dealing with this uh, whole situation kind of shows that he wants to prolong this conflict mm -hmm. as well. Other than that, the fact that Israel under his leadership is also ex trying its level best to expand the war to Lebanon, to Syria, to Iran as well. This is a way of expanding the whole uh, theater of war mm -hmm. and this will legitimize his stay into power in Israel as well. So this is a dual strategy. And Israel wants to expand this whole uh, theater of war mm. so that Netanyahu can continuously stay in power. So and this they are is also risking destabilizing the entire, entire region. region. Yeah. Uh, although US is against, uh, of course, expansion of this war to other uh, neighboring countries. Uh, but uh, how do you see the internal politics of Israel at this point in time, like you earlier mm. mentioned as well, uh, about, of course, there is a lot of push uh, from other segments of the mm. Israeli society uh, to include uh, mm. uh, ultra-Orthodox -orth Jew mm. Jews into the military service. So mm. there is a lot of uh, social divisions as well as, of course, political divide uh, happening at this point in time. Uh, do you think this is... Uh, going to be impacting the way Israel is going to be dealing uh, with this aggression and war in future? So, Mariam, there are like two ways I basically see this whole political situation unfolding. One area is like uh, the whole political situation inside Israel mm -hmm. and the progressive voices that we talk about, unfortunately, even in Israel, they're very small in number, the progressive voices. When it comes to right-wing Orthodox Jews, they're like more in number and they are much more uh, conservative uh, if you compare them with of Netanyahu. Course. So over there I don't see any situation. One country that has a m significant influence on the way uh, Israel is uh, dealing with the situation and the overall political situation is the US. And when in you look at the internal politics in the US, that's also not really in favor for a ceasefire right now. I'll tell you a few reasons why. One, the presidential elections are coming by the end of this year. There are a lot of like elements within the Democratic uh, Party as well, which are pro-Israel. Mm -hmm. And the Republican Party, I think like 80%, 90% of them are very hyper pro-Israel. Mm -hmm. Now, but, Nathan but, but what about the voters? Because there are a lot of protests, mm -hmm. uh, like other parts of the world, happening in US mm -hmm. as well. And they are not happy with the way US has been dealing so that's uh, a very, with this uh, very Israel. That's a very important question. Mm -hmm. So generally what happens is whenever there's a competition between the Democratic Democrats and the Republican Party, there are a few states in the US which are generally known to be swing states. Mm -hmm. Michigan is a very important sim right. swing state and that kind of like decides whether the Democrats or the Republicans will be in uh, power or not. This time around in Michigan, uh, the minorities vote the Muslim vote, the Arab vote, and the progressive Democrats, they are not in favor of the way Biden administration has handled this crisis. So they are not likely to vote for Biden. And it could also uh, uh, point towards a shift that this time around, uh, President Biden might even lose the election. And now it's a lose-lose situation for him because Netanyahu historically has been very pro-Trump because Trump is historically very pro-Israel. Right. So, so this whoever is, is a president in the U.S. We will know have that substantial. Uh, of course. But mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, uh, whoever is going to be the president, they yeah. are going to be pro-Israel. We know that. Yeah. So that foreign policy towards uh, this crisis is mm -hmm. not going to be changing at in least foreseeable not in the future. Not in the of course. Elections. So uh, talking about the situation in uh, Gaza, uh, Dr. Saber, uh, how do you see, uh, of course, about uh, what do you make of uh, this food insecurity um, in uh, Gaza, especially uh, when we uh, talk about the attacks 
uh, on aid workers have uh, increased uh, in the recent days and uh, what kind of strategies are needed at this point in time uh, to ensure uh, of course the food supply uh, is being given to uh, of course this uh, these um, uh, these civilians that are suffering in the region which is already defeated on the 7th of October after the operation storm Alexa, they, they, they will remain fair because if any ceasefire, if any, if any peace without any mutual consent, it will be not uh, long term and not will be not would be the uh, any complete ceasefire. Uh, and negotiations as well and countries like Qatar, uh, Egypt and US as well uh, ha had played their part. But how do you think that uh, in the recent days, this crisis and of course with uh, the international community raising their voices uh, against Israeli aggression have impacted Israel's uh, diplomatic uh, relations with its neighboring countries and especially uh, in the backdrop of the recent attack of uh, um, Israeli and re recent uh, Israeli strikes on, um, of course, uh, this um, Iranian uh, consulate in Cairo? Well, uh, as regards the attack on Israel, uh, I mean, Iranian consulate by Israel, uh, as far as the Western powers are concerned, they've always been very critical of uh, Iran. And right, but at the Israel same time, aren't these uh, protected by Geneva Convention? Because this is a consulate, so this right, is a major but violation. But they are violating international mm. law anyway. Mm. So for them, pick and choose is not the issue. They are just violators and they are continuing to violate. But my fear is they are trying to embroil more countries in the war. So the arena of the war is being expanded and if it does so, then it will become a real devastation for the world uh, because more and more will get uh, embroiled in it. Uh, as far as uh, Qatar and Egypt and USA and China and Russia, all these countries are doing their uh, you know, backdoor negotiations. Uh, you remember the earlier resolution uh, that uh, USA had vetoed. Uh, was uh, supported by China and Russia. And then the resolution that was tabled by USA of course, was yeah. vetoed by China and Russia because yeah. it really didn't call for a ceasefire. Mm. What it was calling for was conditions for ceasefire, mm. which means it's very subjective. If Israel doesn't feel the conditions are right, they're not going to go for ceasefire. And that's why China and Russia vetoed uh, that resolution. So the global politics is also very complex. Uh, on the ground, Netanyahu's existence is now at stake as a political leader. Uh, the hostage uh, crisis that Israelis have has generated so much of criticism against uh, Netanyahu and now they're calling for earlier elections, but if they do go for elections, Netanyahu is bound to lose. Mm. So as Shahriar was saying, their strategy is to prolong the, the war, war so that uh, Netanyahu gets time for himself. Uh, if elections are held today, he is uh, bound to lose. At this moment, uh, not only the families of the hostages that are there, now, Israelis from remote areas are also coming, traveling, uh, you know, hmm. five, six hours of journey to come to the main cities to make their point that they do not agree with the politics of Mr. Netanyahu. So, domestically, he is under threat and therefore, uh, he is doing all these violations to secure his personal a hold in uh, on power hmm. because uh, we we, uh, we remember that after October seventh, of course, uh, a lot of opposition parties uh, 
rather all the opposition parties uh, of course stood with Netanyahu um, uh, in his policies but as the time is passing of course there is a lot of chaos um, in um, Israel as well uh, regarding the policies and the way Netanyahu is dealing with the, uh, uh, this aggression and at the same time they are questioning the way uh, this government is dealing its ties uh, with uh, other stakeholders like United States. So how do you see this uh, relationship or the U.S. stance that has evolved uh, since October 7th? U.S. stance has evolved mm -hmm. because earlier on uh, there was a total support but Blinken also visited uh, Israel and uh, uh, then they were, you know, trying to tell them to not uh, exceed the genocide convention, definition of genocide of the Palestinians. And now for the first time, their abstainment from the resolution itself is a change in policy because till now they were vetoing against it. But their abstention is also a slap on Netanyahu's face because the, this is the only supporter they have, main supporter, right. of course the European countries also some of them, but that itself is a slap on Netanyahu's face and yet he is continuing with it. So, uh, so now what kind of international pressure is required uh, for Israel to end its aggression and especially when we talk about uh, the blockade of humanitarian aid uh, in Gaza? The international pressure uh, needs to be further uh, concretized and like earlier on we were talking about attack on the uh, aid uh, organizations, humanitarian aid organizations and in my view the main reason for that was that while they were uh, giving aid they were also having data of how many people are suffering mm. and that becomes a record of United Nations on the magnitude of humanitarian crisis that exists in Palestine mm. and that's why Israel would not like any neutral or international NGO organization to come and you know create record against their atrocities mm -hmm. and that is the reason why it was not just that they were threatening others from coming it is that this is statistical data on a what level of violation is taking place on the ground. Of course and talking about this violation um, uh, on ground in uh, Gaza. Dr. Sabir, uh, what do you make of uh, this Israeli aggression, especially in regards to UNRWA functions? And of course, uh, they are also targeted as well so that they cannot provide uh, stories to the world. Uh, just uh, yesterday, we know that, of course, uh, Netanyahu also said that uh, he would be blocking access of uh, uh, foreign journalists and media uh, within Israel and uh, the surrounding areas. So, what do you make of all uh, this in regards to uh, the stories that are coming out at this point in time? Uh, first of all, about the question, uh, we know very well that the creation of Israel is an illegitimate position. And from the creation, Zionist entity has always adopted the policy of expansion in the region as already you, you exposed this fact in your talks in a few minutes ago. So these expansions, these expansion and the, this kind of policy is very clear um, message for all of us that Israel cannot allow anyone. In the war of Gaza, we are witnessing that all factor, even your journalist community, even the aid community, even children, women, everyone, doctors, professors, teachers, no one from the life of the, uh, no one from the working of the life, all people has been uh, suffering due to, due to the expansion policies of the Zionist regime. So that's why we, we said and we say that, especially father of the nation, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, always stated that Israel is an illegitimate state. This was the reason to, to, to say them illegitimate. So this policy is uh, the core policy of the Zionist regime, which is trying to kill everyone, to stop aid, to kill, to genocide. So we conclude that this is the organized and systematic genocide of the Palestinian in the Gaza Strip. There are uh, 2.4 million people are suffering still 7th of October.
Right, of course, and like you earlier uh, alluded to as well, that uh, this is not a conflict that started uh, on October 7th, uh, but of course it has a history. Uh, but like uh, earlier we were discussing about how journalists are being attacked and uh, Netanyahu's new policy is to block uh, the coverage of uh, foreign, uh, of course, broadcasters like Al Jazeera uh, to report uh, from uh, that territory as well. Uh, so uh, what do you think uh, that over time uh, the public perception about uh, this conflict has evolved and what do you make of the public opinion at this point in time where we are witnessing uh, protests across the globe? Yes, the public opinion has been aroused, and we are witnessing that, in, especially in the Western countries, uh, there are people uh, on the streets on uh, every Saturday and Sunday. They come on the street, millions of people. They are, they are, they are doing protest against their own governments and also the genocidal acts of the Zionist regime, and especially in the whole of the world, even Latin America, even Africa even in Europe and Asia. So uh, this war and this incident has evolved uh, the sentiments of people and we are witness that before 7th of October the Palestinian cause was demoralized and was in the last of the list. But now the Palestinian cause at the top of the list of the world and the world politics is based on the Gaza situation. The world politics is based on the Gaza ceasefire, and we are uh, we are watching and we are observing that uh, United States, Turkey, and other governments, while even Muslim and non-Muslim, all governments, if, if they have elections in their countries, they have a problem. The people are asking the question: Are you with Gaza or not? So this is the line of uh, right and wrong, and we say that this is evolution of the. Uh, people, uh, those are right. uh, ending with the, with the, right. the and, right side of and, the history, and especially in Gaza. Right, of course, and it has put a lot of pressure on uh, the leadership as well of uh, different countries. We have witnessed how the response of uh, the world leaders have evolved over time. Uh, but Ambassador Saiba, how do you view uh, the regional alliances and geopolitical dynamics uh, that have changed, especially uh, in the context of recent developments? Well, uh, that's a very... Uh, good question that how uh, the international system is evolving because mm. of this uh, uh, war on, on mm. Gaza and you can see that uh, how uh, the Houthi attack on all the trade that was going on mm. with Israel has impacted their economy mm. and now they would be in a mm. difficult situation not only politically isolated mm. but economically also. global also. supply chain is being disrupted. Yes, the go mm. global uh, supply chain has been disrupted with this and then how would countries that were benefiting or profiting from this trade mm. would realign themselves. Mm. Uh, that needs to be seen. Uh, at the same time uh, the Russian-Ukraine war also is now impacting uh, the international system and with this Israeli attack on Gaza, the international world order is now in a very difficult situation uh, as to what principal positions can they take if their biases are in favor or against uh, uh, either what you call victim or what you call aggressor. Hmm. But do you think that uh, there could be some steps uh, taken to address the root causes of the conflict? Of course there can be steps, but who is going to take it hmm. and why? With what uh, Western interest would they do so? Uh, hmm. The Belfort Declaration was basically the British giving land which didn't belong to them, hmm. to people who didn't belong there. Hmm. And it was supposed to be only an enclave in the land of Palestine. Mm. And now Palestine is not even an enclave in this Israeli occupied mm. area. So you can see the paradoxes, how mm. history has changed uh, right. all these. And then Palestine itself, uh, what is uh, the PA, the Palestinian Authority doing? Uh, what authority does it have to negotiate? Uh, how is a Hamas uh, 
uh, going to negotiate, they are being rendered voiceless because of their internal dynamics also. Mm. So it is not as simple as that and the whole idea to divide Palestine was for the reason that they would never be able to stand with one voice to right. for their own rights. Of course and that has been a colonial legacy that I have seen we witnessed in other uh, parts of the world as well exactly, and of course but this particular Israeli conflict. Israeli strategy also of course to you know create fragment. rifts within the uh, Palestinian, Palestinian uh, society as well. Exactly. Uh, Right, but uh, Sharia coming uh, to the earlier question that I asked Ambassador Saiba uh, about as well, about the regional alliances, uh, what kind of alliances do you foresee uh, in the context of recent developments, especially with the recent uh, Israeli uh, attacks and of course uh, the response uh, that uh, they are saying they are going, going to be given to, uh, giving to the aggressor? So the alliances that I see emerging are uh, basically the West that would be supporting Israel. Other than that, I basically see an alliance emerging between Iran, uh, Lebanon, Syria and they would probably be supported uh, by Russia. So this is an evolutionary uh, phase in which I basically see the conflict erupting and taking other countries uh, into the fire of this uh, whole uh, conflict. Um, when it comes to the key player in this whole situation, which is the US, I don't see their policy changing, at least until the elections or even after that mm. as well. Generally, the US establishment, the Republican Party, the Democrats, right. they're all on one page but, but, when it comes but to But what about the Israel. spillover of this war to the neighboring areas and for the region at, uh, at large as well? Because mm. this is going to be impacting uh, global uh, politics and not only the politics, but as we know, uh, like uh, Ambassador Saiba also alluded to mm. about the global supply chains that are being erupted and of course, the inflation and the food insecurity that the uh, globe is going to be facing in coming days. So do you think that is uh, something to be of concern to the wo Western world and to the US as well? Marim, I basically see that the whole legitimacy of the international rules based order is in question right now. Mm. Just to talk about international supply chains and the way the products will reach from one area to another that is like now on the back burner. Uh, if this situation does not like settle. Um, right now, as we are like talking, uh, Israel is trying its best to dismantle the UN refugee agency that looks after Palestine. They have already tabled a resolution in, in which they are blocking Al Jazeera from uh, reporting from their uh, territories of uh, Palestine. They, ironically, on 8th May, the US will be rep uh, releasing a report in which they will basically give a assessment of whether Israel is compliant with the international humanitarian law and I would be very surprised if they basically hold Israel accountable. So the way we are see seeing that the international rules based order is in question right now mm -hmm. and there is this state which is acting with immunity without any account accountability and that is bringing into question the whole legitimacy of the UN uh, system as well. Mm -hmm. They are like international now there has been uh, a resolution that has passed talking about a ceasefire even though as Ambassador Saab uh, mentioned that the US abstained. Mm. But all of these international institutions that basically represent mm. an international mm. rules based order, their whole legitimacy is now in question. So in the hindsight this conflict has exposed the flaws in international uh, system as well and what needs to be done to provide justice uh, to of course civilians uh, suffering not only in Gaza but other parts of the world as well. Uh, but Dr. Saber coming back uh, to of course uh, the civilians in uh, Gaza uh, with, with attacks continuing <coughs> on the aid workers, what do you make of the situation and especially Israeli uh, efforts to dismantle agencies like UNRWA and of course uh, with the funding stopped although a lot of countries are now uh, reinstating their funding back uh, to UNRWA. How do you see in uh, coming days uh, the workers and the situations that they are facing uh, to of course uh, uh, s supply humanitarian aid uh, to people in Gaza. Uh, before come to your question, uh, I would like to comment on the regional uh, politics as you questioned before to, to guess right. uh, about the regional uh, blocks. Yes, uh, we are witness that the uh, unipolar, multipolar, bipolar and now we are facing the era 
where is the regional politics. We don't have the words after seeing these crimes, war crimes, genocide, and many things we cannot elaborate here. Uh, so what we say, we are, uh, we are wordless. We, we don't have words to right. how we can say. Right. So, uh, Dr. Sabir, how do you see the prospects for stability in the Middle East in uh, the coming days, uh, especially with, of course, Israeli aggression expanding and Israeli efforts to um, uh, make this uh, expansion of uh, war in the neighboring countries as well? Uh, the stability of the region is possible only, only, only if we should give the right of return to the oppressed people of Palestine and then we allow, then the international community to allow them referendum. Only referendum can choose the uh, future of this uh, region because until Zionist regime is existing in this region and the Palestinian conflict is exist, there will be no security because I do repeat, Israel was created to occupy, occupy all of the resources in the West Asian countries, not only West Asia, but all of the Asian countries. So this is the main root cause. We should, we should go through the root cause and we should solve the the issue of Palestine and which is very simple in the United Nations from the 1948 the right of return is pending the right of self-determination which is called referendum is pending so so why so why all the international community is not uh, taking action for these uh, for this solution uh, I think we, we should go through if we cannot go so this stability will not become Right, of course, of course. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Sabir Abu Mariam, for joining yeah, us in today's you. program. Uh, thank you very much, uh, former Ambassador Naila Chohan, for joining us in today's program. Thank you very much, Mr. Sheryar Khan, for joining us in today's program. Of course, uh, in today's program, we explored uh, the harrowing uh, realities of uh, people in uh, Gaza. And when we talk about this conflict, it is important uh, not to forget uh, the human cost of war and it is imperative for the international community uh, to work towards lasting peace. That's all from Game Changer tonight. Take care. Allah Hafiz.